Welcome to the Lizzie Borden Podcast, Episode 17. I am your host, Stephanie Corey, filling in for the late Richard Behrens, author of the Lizzie Borden Girl Detective series of mysteries. The Lizzie Borden Podcast is the only podcast entirely devoted to the study of the Borden murders of 1892, Lizzie Borden, and sometimes the history of her hometown, Fall River, Massachusetts. Produced by Nine Muses Books and Anna Behrens. Each episode explores some aspect of the mystery that is Lizzie Borden. From the origins of the doggerel, Lizzie Borden took an axe, to a primer on the case by noted authors and experts, including dramatic readings of Richard Barron's Lizzie Borden Girl Detective Mystery Series. In this episode, we interview Rory Raven, author of three books of nonfiction, The Door War, Burning the Gatsby, and my favorite, Wicked Conduct, about the Sarah Cornell murder in Fall River in 1832, as well as three works of fiction, Gallows Hill, Summerland, and most recently, Signor Lugosi and other stories. Rory is also a tour guide in Salem, Massachusetts, giving talks on various topics, including the witch trials. But today, Rory is here to discuss spiritualism in the 19th century. And now, the Lizzie Borden Podcast presents an interview with Rory Raven. Today, we're welcoming Rory Raven, who is a performer, writer, and tour guide. Rory grew up surrounded by books, history, and the long shadows of Poe, Hawthorne, and Lovecraft. Originally from Providence, he currently lives in Salem with his patient, long-suffering wife. We'll have to talk about that. They're treeing walker coonhounds and a pair of black cats. He left his heart in Rhode Island, he says, where it was burned on a rock. Hmm, interesting. But according to your website, you're also a mentalist and a mind bender. Those things as well. What is a mentalist? Um, A mentalist is a performer who specializes in things that look psychic. (laughs) Okay. Look psychic. Look psychic. Okay, and then the mind bender. You bend minds of your audience, no doubt. I, I have on occasion, yes. I think you. Be- I think I witnessed that once. I think I witnessed you bending minds in Fall River. Actually, been to Fall River a couple times uh, to perform. It's always a fun time. The audience was wowed as always because you are a consummate performer and very entertaining. Today we're talking about spiritualism which is something that you have know quite a bit about and something that you have done talks about most recently, maybe not most recently, but I saw you do a Facebook lecture, not really a lecture, more of a a chat about spiritualism. And you talked about its origins and you talked about its popularity. But before we get into that, we should probably define the term, I think, because Spiritualism can mean different things to different people. I think if we stick to the idea that spiritualism is about the belief that we can speak to the dead and define it just in that narrow way, then we are talking about the same thing, aren't we? Yeah. I mean, spiritualism, uh, the traditional definition of spiritualism is that it's uh, a kind of uh, pseudo-religious philosophical movement that... Uh, begins in the mid 19th century in the United States. And uh, the belief is that you can contact the dead at seances. And there are gifted individuals who are mediums uh, who can put you in contact with the dead. That's kind of the the strict definition of it. Um, That's the definition I've always used. Uh, So it, it differs from, you know, theosophy and spirituality and other stuff. Right. Spirituality, which is different than spiritualism. Right. Spirituality is about more of a connection to things inanimate right. in the earth, the wind, the trees, you know, being a naturalist can be spiritual, but 
spiritualism, like you said, started, do they kind of date it for like 1848 with the Fox sisters? Is that sort of where it starts in America? Um, March 31st, 1848. That is the birthday. Um, that is when the Fox sisters hear these mysterious raps uh, in the, the cottage where they live with their family. Um, and they're not sure where they're coming from. And eventually, uh, we're talking about two little girls named Katie and Maggie Fox. They're, they're children. Their ages are a little bit hard to pin down, but uh, you know, not quite teenagers yet. And they hear these, these weird raps all around the family cottage. This is Hydesville, New York. This is way in upstate New York near Rochester. Okay in an area called the burned over district and that part of new york burned over district because it's been burned over by so many weird religious revivals oh that part of upstate new york was kind of like the southern california of the day (laughs) Um, okay crazy hippie place that's where there were you know communes um this is actually where joseph smith oh uh, Angel Maroney, who uh, he finds the golden tablets. That's all in upstate New York. So Mormonism comes out of uh, that that area. So it, it's an area where there's a lot of interesting stuff going on, and then spiritualism is another one of those interesting things. So it, it comes it comes right out of that very specific date and time, and you know people start coming from from miles around uh, to listen to the the spirits. And the one of the sisters realizes that if you if you recite the alphabet. Um, the spirits will rap at the appropriate letter, and now you can spell whole messages out. So the the spirits proceed, or the the spirit proceeds to claim that it is the 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 spirit of a peddler who had been murdered and buried in the cellar of the house by a previous tenant who still lived in Hydesville. So uh, that guy whose name was Bell kind of gets uh, gets the hairy eyeball from people for a while. <laughs> There's a petition uh, signed by a number of people living in town saying, no, 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 Bell is, is okay. He, he didn't murder anyone. So that, that's, that's really where it all begins. And, and people latch on to the, the idea from there. Oddly, it's teenage girls. Oddly, similarly to the Salem witch trial situation, right. which we don't have to talk about, but that's your specialty. Um, teenage girls starting a hysteria. So teenage girls starting it, but like the Salem Witch Trials, adults jumping on it. Right, right, right. Yeah, they, they, they don't really get all the blame. Um, one of the the adults who gets involved is uh, Katie and Maggie Fox's older sister named Leah. Uh, Leah is living in Rochester with her husband. She's been out of the house for, for quite a few years at that point. She hears about what's going on uh, at the family home so she goes back home to to figure to find out what the hell's going on and and from uh margaret fox's later account leah immediately pulls them aside and says how are you doing this yeah that there was no question uh that it was really the spirits leah was immediately how are you doing this right um and and they they pin a lot of it on her um leah Fox is always or, or usually presented as kind of the villain in the whole story. She's the one who eggs them on um, and sees a chance to monetize this. So she's the one who brings them back to Rochester. Uh, she runs the Corinthian Hall. The okay. Corinthian Hall is a big private uh, public auditorium um, in Rochester. It's apparently the biggest venue in town. Uh, and they put on a public performance there. And that doesn't sound like too much. I mean, you know, go give a performance to a public hall, but that's actually a big kind of a big deal in the development of spiritualism because it's a public hall. Uh, it's not a church. It's not a private institution or, or, or organization. It's a big public hall. And that means that there's no one uh, sect or denomination that can lay claim to this. Um, you know, if they went and performed at a Catholic church, well, then people would say, well, that's a Catholic thing that the spirits, by putting on this initial demonstration in a public hall, that that makes the spirits non-denominational. Um, you don't have to be religious. <laughs> um, you know, they're, they're for every, the spirits are for everyone. Uh, so that that's kind of uh, an important thing. It doesn't seem like an important thing until you stop and think about it for a minute, but it's actually a wicked important thing. Right. Um, what was going on in the United States that caused people to be so, I don't know, enthralled and believing right away without sort of uh, hesitation? 
Well, um, many were and then many weren't. Uh, I mean, there were skeptics right from the beginning. There were some people who, um, there, was, there was one guy who said that uh, he, if he couldn't figure out the what was going on, he would eat his hat. Um, and he, he came to one of the demonstrations there at Corinthian Hall, couldn't figure out what the hell they were doing, and promptly did not eat his hat. Um, <laughs> There were skeptics. Um, there was one, I think it was a newspaper article at the time that said, uh, the writer said that they thought the Fox sisters had some sort of gadget hanging from their inexpressibles, as it said, <laughs> uh, they were using to, to create these noises. So a lot of people really weren't buying this from the beginning, but plenty were. And, and why is that? A few historians have pointed out that the 19th century is uh, a time of kind of those live demonstrations and, you know, believe it or not uh, kind of stuff. There has, uh, mesmerism has been really popular for, for decades. Mesmerism is a, a movement where uh, that, that sort of sets the stage for spiritualism in many ways. Mesmerism is this belief that we all have magnetism, animal magnetism that we give off and that gifted uh, mediums can, can manipulate magnetism to do weird things. It's kind of early hypnosis. Uh, it was like a hypnosis act. And Benjamin Franklin had investigated the claims of mesmerists and uh, uh, declared that it was mostly due to the imagination of the patients. Uh, it was all in their head. Um, but that, I think, set the stage that strange things happen and there are people who can do strange things and you can go see them do strange things at a dollar a head. And it also has a, a kind of, it, it, it hooks into, I always think, a real 19th century idea of, of change and progress and whoosh and proof. And it's scientific. You know, you don't have to be religious uh, to go I to a see. seance. You can, if you're, if you're a doubter, you can go to a seance and you can see it with your own eyes. Um, it's like an empirical religion in a way, you know, you, there, there's definite proof that this happened. You don't have to take it on faith um, because you will see this happen up close. So, you know, it, it makes that makes sense to people. People are convinced by what they see, which again, I think is sort of a, a nice 19th century um, kind of thing. And and uh, it's it's always tempting to kind of write people off just as as you know gullible rubes, um, but but at the same time, you know, they're viewing themselves as being very careful about this. You know, I went to a seance I, and I saw it happen, and I can't explain it. Um, so that that's convincing. What was their show? I mean, the rapping, yes. Was there an interpreter of the rapping? Was it, I mean, how do you think the show was performed? What they would do is they would uh, recite the alphabet, have somebody recite the alphabet, and the spirits would rap at the appropriate letter, and now you can spell out whole messages. But from the audience messages? Um, no, no, from the spirits. No, but I mean, someone from the audience would ask a question, and then the spirit yep. would answer? Yeah. Okay. Yep. It it gets so so there, there's a lot of that. Um okay. so in the early years there there's that sort of thing. It's mostly rappings. Um you occasionally uh a little bit later get direct voice mediums. Um these people who, you know, as we would say trance channel um a spirit. Now it's uh it's said again we're talking 1840s, 1850s, so you know, mid 19th century. Um not a not a super progressive time in, in certain ways. But it was said at the time that uh, that women were were simple and emotional um, and, and that made them the perfect uh, conduit for the spirits. <laughs> um, yeah, because they're not complicated or smart, you know. Um, so, uh, so a number of women became these trans lecturers um, and they would be taken over by the spirits and deliver a lecture from the beyond. And these lectures could go on for hours sometimes. And this, this must have been really surprising for a lot of people because for many people, it's the first time that you're seeing a woman get up and speak in public and be the center of attention. Oh, wow. So amazing. And also, I think, probably kind of appealing uh, for a lot of people. It's interesting to me that it was... I don't know, that it wasn't around forever, that I'll just I'll kind of sort of bloomed out of this this family. And then they took it on the road. And it was only later that they denounced themselves. Is that not right? Yeah. Um, 
the the Fox sisters and and spiritualism itself uh, is hugely popular for the first five, six years. Um, and then like any craze, it kind of dies down. Um, Fox sisters are, are definitely celebrities. Uh, that, that Horace Greeley, go West, young man. Yes. Um, he hears about them. He brings them down to New York, uh, puts them up in a hotel, and they start giving seances to the, the cream of New York society. So James Fenmore Cooper, who wrote The Last of the Mohicans, he goes to seances. Harry Beecher Stowe, who wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin, she goes to seances. Uh, Julia Ward Howe, Battle from the Republic, she goes to seances there at the, um, the hotel with the Fox sisters. Um, Commodore Cornelius Vanderbilt, the millionaire, uh, mm -hmm. goes to seances and tries to get stock tips from the beyond. <laughs> uh, so he's, he's you know working an angle. Within a few years, it spreads to England. Now, one of the things that people... Uh, don't always realize is people often think that while well, seances, it must be an English thing that comes to America, but it's an American thing that goes to England. Right. So within a few years, some mesmerists in London raised the money to bring a woman from Boston over to hold seances in London. Um, and uh, Charles Dickens goes to a seance with her and um, is not impressed. Uh, Dickens has a, has a background in stage magic. He's an amateur magician himself, and he, he's not impressed. And he said something like, I have not the least belief in the awful unseen being available for evening parties at so much per night. Uh, <laughs> not done any of it. But uh, yeah, it, it's hugely popular uh, for, for a few years, five, six years. Um, one historian said that that, that was its, its highest point. It never becomes that popular again. It kind of wanes for a few years. And then the Civil War. After the Civil War, everybody's grieving. Everybody's lost somebody somewhere. Right. Um, and spiritualism becomes popular again because everyone's trying to reach out to somebody they lost in the war. Fathers, sons, brothers, husbands. Um, so with that kind of, you know, national tragedy, um, right. we'll go back to seances looking for, for closure, a phrase I kind of hate, but, but does apply. Uh, they want some reassurance. They want some help uh, in the grieving. There's also a, a change in the early days, the, the spirit guide. Um, the spirit guide is the, uh, they also call it spirit control. Uh, that's the, the main ghost that you deal with. Uh, so if I'm a medium, I've got a spirit guide and I get in touch with the spirit guide and I say, um, Joe wants to contact his mother and the spirit guide basically says, okay, hang on, I'll be right back. The spirit guide is supposed to go find the mother and bring her back so you can communicate. So um, earlier you have uh, an American Indian is the fashionable spirit guide. Right. Because, and like women, they're, they're uncomplicated and they're, they're spiritual. Um, but after the Civil War, the, the spirit guide of choice becomes uh, a young boy who'd been killed in the Civil War, a drummer boy being typical. Um, so, you know, a, a young tug at your heartstrings, Dickensian kind of figure uh, becomes the, the spirit guide of choice. So. Oh, my goodness. And then we've got the Cottingly Fairies and... Right. And lovely Arthur Conan Doyle, grand grand writer that he was and creator of Sherlock Holmes, yep. a character who lives by his wits, but also by his brain power in deduction, yep. which seems an odd belief believer in spiritualism. So tell us what you know about Doyle. I mean, I know quite a bit about it, but um, it figures into sort of modern day when we tie Conan Doyle into Houdini even later on. So this, this idea of, um, you know, it's rich, rich national folklores and, and, and uh, legends that nations possess as a part of their historical, social, cultural lineage. And Conan Doyle being Scottish had his own national pride and his national knowledge of Scottish lore. So he comes across these little fairies in these fairy pictures and he's intrigued. Early photography, right? right. Again, young girls. Right. <laughs> Somehow they're the most believable of us all. Well, young, uncomplicated innocents, right? Yes, yes. Why? How could they fool us or trick us in any way, shape, or form? So he he becomes enamored of these uh, fairies and these fairy photographs that are taken. But is open minded. He's open minded. He's not quite decided yet. 
but then something happens to him that makes him decide to completely immerse himself in spiritualism and to believe it wholeheartedly until the day of his death. Right. And it's his wife. What happens there? Do you remember that story in 1916? Um, well, his their son dies. Yes. Uh, and that's that's one of the things that's usually cited as kind of pushing it toward him. Yeah. Um, and his uh, his first wife dies forget exactly when she dies offhand. And his his second wife, who seems to be a much better match, really, uh, she's supposed to be mediumistic. Right. Uh, so she holds seances and she does automatic writing. Yes. Um, yes. Which is where the the spirits you know take control of your hand and you just write messages that are. are astrally dictated, I guess, by the, the spirits. So that, that's her, her kind of uh, demonstration, her power. She does automatic writing. You know, Conan Doyle's an interesting case, and, and people, I think sometimes they're a little hard on him um, because they, they say, oh, well, he was just stupid. Um, no, 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 not no, at all. Stupid. Um, you know, I, I think he was, he was fooled, um, and he, he, much like the folks going to seances and accepting the proof of their own eyes, I think Conan Doyle thinks he's being logical about this and thinks the only logical conclusion is there is something supernatural going on. That said, yeah, he's maybe a little bit gullible. Um, he and, and uh, Harry Houdini were good friends for a few years before they, they eventually had a falling out. And uh, at one point, Houdini um, got him with the, uh, with, with the old, the old pulling my thumb off, you know, like this. Yeah. Um, and, and Conan Doyle was completely fooled by that and said something about, well, truly you have great powers. Um, you know, but Conan Doyle also had a sense of humor. Um, in, I think it was 1922, Houdini invited Conan Doyle to a meeting of the SAM, the Society of American Magicians. Uh, not a member. They, he invited him to a, a meeting of, uh, of the SAM in New York. And, uh, they have dinner and they, they show each other stuff they're working on and, and Conan Doyle is just flabbergasted by what he sees. And then it comes Conan Doyle's turn to, to present. And he had a film projector and he loads up some film into the projector and hits play. And he has a short film of actual dinosaurs uh, running around on the screen and, and, and people are freaking out. They have no idea what, what the hell is this? How is this even possible? And there was a film being made of Conan Doyle's novel, The Lost World, where Professor Challenger goes to South America and finds this isolated plateau inhabited by dinosaurs. And uh, it's, it's a fun novel. And they were making a film of that. And these were special effects shots from the, the silent movie they were making. And they're stop motion. Uh, it's, it's early, early stop motion. But these guys had never seen this kind of thing before. So they were flabbergasted that, oh, my God, there are dinosaurs <laughs> running around. So Conan Doyle, you know, had a good laugh fooling the magicians. So he was a smart guy with a sense of humor, even though he was, I think, taken in by people. His wife did this automatic writing one time, I think, and she relayed a conversation that... Doyle had had with his brother, I believe, that was a private conversation that Doyle was convinced no one else knew the details of. And when she did this automatic writing and revealed this to him, that was sort of the turning point for him, where it's, it must be true, it must be true. And then later, him meeting Houdini and thinking him to be of high paranormal abilities, yep. instead of a magician who has learned his tricks of his trade. And it's interesting because there's always been this sort of back and forth between people who know how things are done, like magicians, right. and people who don't know how things are done and think that it's connected to something otherworldly. Right. And you do magic in your show, and part of the mind reading thing that you do is amazing, but you learned the technique. Right. You learned how to do such a thing. Right. And you and you perfected it by practice so that it appears seamless, it appears true, it appears real, and it feels that way to the audience. But you're putting on a show. Right. And the kind of modern show is treating itself as truth. And isn't that fraud? I would say so. 
Yeah, I, I would say so. I I always take a really dim view of the the modern stage mediums who, you know, you, you always see these, I see these things advertised all the time, you know, le- letters from heaven and stuff like that, um, where uh, supposedly a medium is going to come out and, uh, you know, put you in contact with your loved ones. Um, and it, it, it's just, uh, it's this direct voice mediumship again. Um, it's, they, they come out and the spirits speak through them. And it just always looks like guesswork to me. And it, it just seems soulless and, and awful you know it's just, I, I i can't help but see it as anything other than taking advantage of people's grief yeah yeah i did it connected with for instance the lizzie borden case um of which this podcast is called the lizzie borden podcast the history of of the spiritualists coming involved being involved in the case comes from the earliest days of the crime where clairvoyants would hold seances and write down their results and then send them to the chief of police or the district attorney and say, now this will help you solve the case. And so there's all these letters from all these people or, or I had a dream and this is what I know, or Lizzie came to me in my house and we talked about it and this is, and then they're trying to be helpful they believe what they believe to be true, they're, and they're not selling anything. They're just helping in their minds. But then you have, you know, ghost show after ghost show after ghost show after ghost show on television, which is a profit making system right. that comes in and sweeps through and makes all kinds of claims. And all of a sudden you have haunted houses. Right. And it's, it's a business model. Is it not? Sure. The Mark Twain house is now a haunted house. Okay. Great. I I asked the uh, people who run it, how dare you? And they said, we want to stay open. That's that's the problem. Um, you know, I mean, this sort of stuff is always popular. Um, people always enjoy this stuff. Um, so, yeah, if, if you want to stay open, uh, you know, I, I do walking tours here in Salem and I, I did them in Providence when I lived there. And my approach has always been a kind of spooky history tour. And uh, people would say to me, you know, well, why don't you, 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 you'll get a bigger audience if you, you tell people about, you know, orbs and EVPs and cold spots and do it's wicked haunted in there. Uh, you know, <laughs> why aren't you doing that? It's like, well, that just feels creepy and dishonest. Um, I don't think it is wicked haunted in there. So I'm not going to tell you that it is. There are, you know, plenty of tours that yes. will get that stuff. Right. Um, but it, it's always a little creepy to me. We all like to be scared. I mean, we all like the sensationalism of Poe and 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 Lovecraft and Alfred Hitchcock presents. Even I mean, we all like to be scared. I used to read Alfred Hitchcock ghost stories by the yeah. You know, I couldn't get enough of it. We all, at least I, I cannot speak for everybody, but I enjoy somehow being frightened by ghosts watching them on television supposedly or 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 f- being frightened by a movie right but when it's over and i turn it off it was an experience where you have to sort of turn off all your senses of rationality in order to you know watch the thing i mean the exorcist is one of my all-time favorite films <laughs> yep yes yes and lee j cobb i can't get enough of lee j cobb but but it's 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 one thing to believe and it's another thing to sell. Right. So what's the difference between a medium, a clairvoyant, and a psychic? Yeah, I uh, really don't know. Yeah, that's right. Um, so the Society for Psychical Research is a, a group that uh, that was trying to study all this stuff scientifically and they they broke it down into you know what means what. Um so psychic abilities, I mean, psychic just means mental, just of the mind. So uh, they broke it down into, can I remember these now? So uh, telepathy, clairvoyance, precognition, and psychokinesis. These were the, the four areas that they study. So telepathy uh, is mind-to-mind contact. 
Uh, mm-hmm. We send the thought from one person to another without the usual sensory channels being involved. So it's telepathy. Um, so knowing what somebody else is thinking, basically. Clairvoyance uh, would be knowing th- information that is in no one's head, you know, that, that no one could possibly know. So, you know, uh, I, I know, you know, what's, what's happening at some particular location right now. You know, no one around me is thinking about that. I'm just able to pick up on that somehow. That's clairvoyance, right? Oh, no okay. thinking, so there's no, no intermediary involved there. Is that like uh, predicting disasters and things like that? Well, that, that comes out of precognition. Oh. Uh, that's knowing okay. about things ahead of time. And then psychokinesis, which at some point, psychokinesis changed. It became telekinesis. I don't really know when that happens. Uh, when the that, television is invented. <laughs> um, but that's uh, influence, influencing and manipulating physical objects just with your mind. So Yuri Geller and his spoons. Yeah. 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 Which we, which I grew up watching on Johnny Carson. Yeah. Yep. So the... Um, the, for, for clairvoyance, to, to clarify, one of the, the classic kind of Borscht Belt jokes um, <laughs> is, uh, you know, a, a guy comes up to me and he, he says to me, uh, if you're really clairvoyant, tell me what my father's doing right now. And I said, uh, your father is fishing on the Charles River uh, in Boston. And the guy says, no, you're a liar. My father's been dead for 10 years. And I told him, the man your mother married's been dead for ten years. Your father is fishing on the Charles. <laughs> um, yeah, that's clairvoyant. <laughs> um, no, that's a terrible old joke, uh, but that's clairvoyance. Well, we're going to take a break right now, and sure. we'll be back in a moment. You are listening to the Lizzie Borden podcast, produced by Nine Muses Books and Anna Barons. Please check out the Richard Barron's Lizzie Borden Girl Detective series on Amazon.com or LizzieBordenGirlDetective.com. We are back talking to Rory Raven about spiritualism. Uh, We started by talking about the Fox sisters as the birth of spiritualism, but they don't have such a lovely ending to their story. Do they? No. Um, they, uh, they, they have a, a lot of tragedies. Um, one of them uh, gets engaged to an Arctic explorer who disappears, Arctic exploring. So she's devastated. She may or may not have gotten married. She says she, they were married, but no one's quite sure. And, you know, a lot of people are, are, Try to take advantage of them. In 1888, 40 years after it all began, they confess that the whole thing has started as a prank to frighten their mother. The mysterious spirit raps were produced by them cracking the joints of their toes. Ooh. Yeah. They started doing it by tying an apple to a string and dangling that behind the headboard of their in their bedroom. They would tug on the, the string and it would thump against the wall. But later they they realize they could crack their toes. So when Leah arrives on the scene and pulls them aside and says, you know, what the hell are you doing? Show me how this works. They say that they showed her uh, the, the toe cracking and that Leah tried it, but could never do it as well as they could. So uh, yeah, 40 years later, 40 years later, they confess that it had started as a prank to, to frighten their mother. And they give another public demonstration in Brooklyn, uh, the Brooklyn Academy of Music, as I recall, in October of 1888, demonstrating how this works, wow. standing on stage and then cracking the joints of their toes. And um, they, they really just felt it had gotten completely out of hand, you know, 40 years of, of people going to seances and paying lots of money uh, and going through lots of heartbreak for uh for the sake of trying to contact the dead. So they, they tried to put an end to it, but it doesn't work. They actually get hate mail. They got a letter from a woman in Boston, which, uh, which said in part, hundreds of thousands have believed through you and through you alone. And now you tell us all the glorious light we thought you had given us is but the false flicker of the common dip candle of fraud. The disclosures you make take from me all that I have cherished. There's nothing left for me now, save to the hope for the reality of that repose which death promises. So this is somebody saying, you've taken away everything I've been hoping for, and now I'm just going to die, and I hope I stay dead. Pretty awful letter to get from someone to, to know uh, that, that that's how they feel. Right. Um, 
So they they thought they were were going to go on a lecture tour exposing the the secrets, but it turns out that people will come to hear the spirits are real. They won't come here that spirits aren't real. So the the lecture tour never really goes anywhere, and they're they're both broke at this point. They're both drinking heavily. They're they're living in in cheap uh, rooms rooms in. in New York, and they they return to spiritualism. They they start doing seances again. They they oh. recant their confessions and start holding seances again. But the rich and famous aren't coming anymore. They again confess. There's a, a sort of back and forth uh, of of uh, confessing and recanting and confessing again. And uh, they they both die in the 1890s and are are buried, I guess, in you know, cheap paupers' graves in New York somewhere. So it's it's a pretty pretty awful end. They have a terrible, terrible lives. But they started something that they couldn't stop once it got started. Right. And created uh, sort of offshoots from that with the Ouija board inventor, I imagine, was that Ouija boards and seances came from this, from this idea of speaking to the dead. Sure. And a Ouija board is an American invention also, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, well, there are um, there are you know earlier examples. The idea probably that probably does go back to England. There, there's uh, I've seen references to pre Ouija board Ouija boards um, where you you lay out the alphabet on cards um, A B C D E F G uh, around the edge of a table, and you put a glass in the middle, an upended glass. Uh, you have everyone reach over and put a finger on the glass, and the glass scoots across uh, to to each letter to spell out a message. Years ago, I did that for a seance that I staged, and I thought, I, I I promise you, I will I will not gimmick any of this. I will try this experiment. I will see what happens. If nothing happens, I can move on to something else. But I, I just want to make the experiment to see where this goes. So I went around the circle, and we invented a spirit. I, I had them come up with a name and a place that the ghost was from and when they died and you know the names of the children, you know, a, a few different random details about the the spirit, uh, all completely made up on the spot by by the people who were there. And I laid uh, the alphabet out in a circle on the table on three by five cards and put a glass uh, in the middle. I didn't touch anything. I had people put their fingers on the glass and um, the, the ghost they invented was called Sarah Beth. Um, <laughs> and uh, I said, okay, think about Sarah Beth being here. Think about, don't, you don't have to believe it, but just sort of play with that idea for a minute. And I swear to you, it took about a minute, but that glass while they were touching it scooted over to the S and then took about half a minute for it to get over to the B. And I had people switch back and forth. Uh, I had people switch out and brought other people in uh, to continue in case somebody was knowingly pushing the glass uh, themselves. And th- it, it fed back all the information that we had just made up. Nobody, but nobody was more surprised than me uh, watching that happen. So what do you what do you think was the situation there? Oh, idiomotor response. Yes, uh, exactly. Yeah. You know, people unconsciously moving the thing. And it could very well have been, you know, some people pushing it intentionally for the sake of having some fun. Um, that's certainly possible as well. Right, right. But people want, yes, that's exactly, that's exactly what I always imagined it to be. Right. Just a not on purpose kind of situation where you are so in uh, attuned and focused on this project or on this thing that you are assisting in its reality. Yep. Yeah. Jeez. Which in a way I think is is almost freakier than thinking it's really a ghost. No, I agree with you. I agree with the idea that our minds can do that and yep. and we are uh participants without even realizing it. Right. Uh, uh, table tipping and chalk it up to an uneven table leg for sure. But um, yeah, Michael Faraday does some experiments in table tipping. Um, he takes a, a small table, the kind of thing that you do table tipping with, and he lays several layers of uh, slick cardboard on top of it. And he has people stand around and rest their fingers on the top sheet of the cardboard. 
And if the spirits are moving the table around, you'd expect the table to move around, but the table doesn't. Um, but people, as they're holding on, as they're resting their fingertips on the top sheet of cardboard, that starts to move around by itself. Uh. People doing this and not the table moving of its own accord, right? Right. Oh, Which, okay. Yeah. yeah. Is, is like a, almost freakier than, than uh, the table moving by itself. It's, you know, people doing this unconsciously. Uh, James Randi was always one of my big heroes. Um, I liked that he he knew how things worked being a magician, but he also offered anyone an opportunity to prove it. Right. Prove it and offered big money. And he died without anybody ever claiming it because nobody could ever prove it. Right. And if it's scientific, if it's a fact... If it's some truth, then it should be able to be proven and repeatable, shouldn't it? Right. Isn't that what science is all about? Repeating things? Right. Yes. So, And yet so many intellectuals, um, William James, were involved. So many famous, thoughtful people wanted to believe and did believe. Yeah, I mean... Uh... There, there are folks who, in my younger days, when I was, you know, more, more obnoxious about a lot of things, um, <laughs> I was written them off as stupid. Um, but as I've gotten older um, and hopefully a little more uh, compassionate, um, I, I tend to think that there are, that people just see stuff that they find convincing. That is, for whatever reason, convinces them. Um, might not convince me or you, uh, but it, it's it's persuasive to them, right? Uh, you know, as opposed to just being being stupid. Um, so no, I just... wouldn't. I wouldn't call it a stupidity. Again, it's. A, I think John Lennon said, "Whatever gets you through the night." You know, right. if yeah. if you need that, if that's something you need in order to get through tonight or tomorrow, to know that there is this. Uh, of the world and you can communicate with it or you can communicate with someone who's dead, then there's a sort of a peace that comes from that. I mean, I can understand the reason why people would be soothed by that thought and would be eager to believe those kinds of things. I do understand that completely. It's the same as any religion actually. It's the belief in anything that you cannot see that is supernatural. God is supernatural. I mean, I understand the belief in God. I understand the miracles that people believe in the miracles of Jesus. I understand why. But what I still have a problem with is when I come against the professional psychic. Right. Who is not playing games, but is collecting money from the vulnerable like you say yeah that that's that to me is just, just fraud you know people have their own experiences and you can't i i had a uh, a conversation with a psychic medium i think that's how they combine the two together for themselves a psychic medium we had a conversation with lizzie borden at maplecroft and lizzie borden was apparently upset that there were references to the crimes in her home in Maplecroft. So this psychic medium who was doing this television show had removed all of anything that had to do with the crime that reminded anybody of the crime and then sat down and apparently had a long conversation with the spirit of Lizzie Borden as an old woman living in this house who was kindly and thoughtful and, and calm and I said to her, how can she be in two places at the same time? How can there be the killer Lizzie oh, down on Second Street, which everybody goes and talks to, right. the evil, maniacal murderer Lizzie, and then the kindly old spirit Lizzie in Maplecroft? How can there be two entirely different ghosts of the same person? I thought I had her. I thought I had her. <laughs> I thought I won that argument. <laughs> but Rory, she said to me, anything's possible in the spirit world. Nice. Ah, ah, 
I uh, lose again. So close. <laughs> so close. <laughs> um, so you were talking about Houdini and Conan Doyle earlier. Goes along with what we're we're talking about in that. Uh, one of the things that that causes a real rift between them is that in the 20s they're both in atlantic city and conan doyle invites uh houdini to go to a seance there at their hotel room and my wife will do some automatic writing for you so they they sit down uh and and lady jean begins her uh, her automatic writing and she supposedly uh gets a, a letter from houdini's mother uh cecilia and it's this, you know, oh, my darling boy, I'm, I'm so glad I came through. Um, I, I know you've always wanted to hear from me and I'm, I'm finally here and I, I can, I'm coming to you through this, this lovely lady. And she, um, I believe she wishes the um, uh, Conan Doyle and his wife, uh, Merry Christmas. And uh, also in the, at the beginning, right at the top of the letter, there's a cross has been drawn. Mm. Uh, and uh when all this this is 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 over, Houdini points out a few different obvious problems. One being that he's Jewish, mm -hmm. um, his his father was a rabbi. Mm -hmm. um, he found it kind of unlikely that that his mother would start by drawing a cross mm -hmm. uh, on the top of the page. The letters in English, uh, which his mother never learned to speak, mm -hmm. um, and that was kind of the, the medium's response or. or Conan Doyle's response was that, you know, anything is possible with the spirits, you know, now she can speak English. Um, <laughs> oh, and, and, you know, Houdini didn't, didn't really take that very well. Um, thought this was kind of making a mockery of him. Um, so that, that I think is the thing that really causes the rift between them. Uh, I think they were able to kind of disagree in a gentlemanly way until that, uh, that, that just sort of puts Houdini over the edge. Well, I have friends who actually make a living of it. I use friends in terms of like Facebook friends, not like friend friends, not right. like we hang out. Right. But I have friends who are uh, true believers and who practice and who um, do podcasts about it and have a following. And it's interesting to me how they are there. It's not them who will argue with you. It's their following that will attack. You know, they will... Um, they'll uh, come out and tell you to where to go if you don't believe uh, what this person is offering. It's a, it's a protection mechanism. They like have a posse. And so one time I was asked by one podcaster if I would come on and argue against ghosts and state my case and we could have a debate. And I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> like... No. <laughs> How can I argue about something you believe in? Right. I can't, I can't, I can't dissuade you. I'm not trying to dissuade you. Right. At all. I, I don't want to dissuade any one of their belief systems. I just want, I just hope that the, the I don't know. I just, people need to like stop ripping people off is my thing. And I don't know how to, I don't know how to do that. And, and, and those, those psychics and clairvoyants who were trying to help with the Lizzie Borden case back in 1892, you know, they weren't doing anything for anyone except to help. It's right. a big difference between Arthur Ford and it's a big difference between uh, Edgar Casey. All right. You know, Edgar Casey never took any money. Right. He didn't, he didn't accept any money for what he did. Um, which makes him a little bit more on the believable side because what he was doing was curing people of their illnesses, and it took a lot out of him. But he but he wrote a zillion books. Right. There was his income. Hmm. Um, but there's this, um, I don't know, there's this, I feel sorry for people who are taken advantage of. And that's sort of where I draw the line, but there's nothing I can do about it, you know? Right. Because people will be, will be gullible. Yeah, I mean, you you just you want people to be on the same page, or I do. Um, you, know, you you kind of want people to to know what it is they're getting. Um, you know, I've I've gone to tarot readers here in town, um, okay. and you know, I don't take them that seriously. Um, but hey, I might actually learn something. Uh, right. I don't, I don't right. think they have the the key to the future uh in their their hands but uh, you know i i do it 
more for entertainment than anything else. Um, but that's, you know, that's why, that's why I'm doing it. Um, and as, as long as, as we're both kind of on the same page, then I think it's, it's okay. Right. Uh, it's framed by entertainment. Right. It's framed by a show. Yes. There is a, a, to me, kind of amoral argument that I've seen on more than one occasion um, with folks who will present the kind of stuff that I do, uh, you know, a show, but not tell people it's a show. And, and the attitude, which seems creepy to me, um, is, uh, you know, I don't get to tell you what entertainment is. Maybe you find this entertaining. You know, maybe me talking to your dead grandmother uh, and telling you to bring the diamonds in for blessing. Uh, you know, maybe that's entertainment to you. And I don't get to tell you what's entertainment. Um, and that, that always seems creepy. That just seems excuse making to me. Yeah. I'm going to do what I do. I'm going to call it entertainment. And, and that's that. Um, yeah, that, that's. It used to, it did they, wasn't it a crime somewhere to. Wasn't it criminal to be a medium at one point? Um, Houdini tried to um, have it outlawed. He testified before Congress, and um, so that's it, interesting. It had been outlawed uh, here and there, uh, but I think it often uh, gets unoutlawed um, because of uh, religious religious freedom. Right, right. Uh, you know, what if talking to the dead is part of my religion? All right, well, that's that's hard to argue with that one. Uh, so. Yeah, well, there's no answer, but this uh, examination of spiritualism has been most enlightening, and I never get tired of hearing about all these characters, um, from Houdini to Doyle to the Fox sisters. I think, the, oh, I mean, the Bell Witch, we didn't even talk about the Bell Witch and poltergeist activity and <laughs> the kinds of, once again, centered around teenage or prepubescent or pubescent girls. Right. Um, it, it always seems to kind of come from that innocence, like you say, that is uh, endlessly fascinating to me. And right. I do enjoy watching your show and I do enjoy listening to you at any opportunity I can get because yeah. you are well read and you are someone who knows what they're talking about. So it's, it's a it's an education as well as entertainment when I see you perform. Uh, somebody had uh, had said recently that the the key to looking like you always know what you're talking about is to uh, only talk about the one or two things you know about. <laughs> <laughs> You've got a couple of books on the horizon. What's coming next for you? Um, I, I've got. Uh, few murder mystery, uh, two murder mysteries out that are set in modern day Salem. Those were a lot of fun to do. When people think of Salem, they always tend to think of 1692. I am intrigued by the modern tourist town and how Salem does and doesn't live up to its reputation. Um, So that was my, that's my setting. Uh, Finishing up the third one now. What are their names, by the way? Gallows Hill Uh, is one of them. First one's called Gallows Hill. Yeah. Uh, The second one's called The Afflicted Girl. Phrase you always hear regarding the witch trials is the afflicted girls yes. um, who made the initial accusation. So I, I went with the afflicted girl. It's a, a young woman who comes to Salem because she thinks she's the reincarnation of Bridget Bishop, the first woman okay. to be hanged in the witch trials. Um, while she's here in town, she witnesses a murder, as one does. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so the detective and the killer are both looking for her um, here in Salem. And she's trying to to keep a low profile. The newest one is a book of short stories it's called Senor Lugosi. And that's uh, it's 13 short stories oh. uh, and a bonus essay. So those, those were fun. Uh, there's one called Summerland, which is set in Gilded Age Newport. And it's about a, a magician and a medium and their battle of wills. Oh, I've got to read that one. That and then, of course, you've written a Sarah Cornell book, Wicked yeah. Conduct. Yep. And The Gaspar. Gatsby, yep. Um, Gatsby. Yeah, the Sarah Cornell was a, a fun one to do. I, I had written a book that was the ghost stories I told on my tour in Providence, um, and the the publisher came back to me and said, "Okay, that that was you know that was a good book. You, do you want to do a second one?" I said, "Sure. I'm not sure what I would write about." And they said, "Well, Rhode Island, you know, is a it's a real mafia uh, kind of hangout. Why don't you write about the mafia in Rhode Island?" And no. I said, said no. No. 
First, I don't have any real interest in the mafia, to be honest. Um, and secondly, yeah, if I write about the mafia in Rhode Island, are you going to come over and start up my car for me every morning? Right, exactly. So uh, I had remembered reading years ago about the murder of Sarah Cornell. Uh, and that seemed fascinating. So I started to read up on it. It was so much more fascinating than I thought. Um, the story was a lot more complicated and a lot more moving parts than I, I had ever imagined. So it's a short book. It could easily be a much bigger book. It, uh, your treatment of that case is magnificent. And it is, uh, it's, I recommend it to everyone I can think of. It is accessible and it is thorough. Uh, surprisingly small for what it is inside. I know that particular publisher myself, and they always have word count requirements. So that's one of the reasons why I'm sure it was small, but it is a really great book. And I do, maybe you can come back sometime and talk about Sarah Cornell. Sure. That's another Fall River murder. Another Fall River murder. Lizzie yes. Borden before Lizzie Borden. Before Lizzie Borden. What, 1833, something like that? Yeah, 1831. Yes, like 60 years, 60 years before. Yep. And, and yeah, that would be fabulous. I really would like to invite you back. Well, thank you, Rory. Thank you so very much for this enlightening discussion on spiritualism and the Fox sisters and Doyle and Houdini. And now I know what a medium, a psychic and a clairvoyant is. So that thanks to you. Happy to help. Have a good day. You too. Thanks for having me. Okay. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Lizzie Borden Podcast, Episode 17. We've been talking to Rory Raven on the topic of spiritualism in the 19th century. Rory is a prolific author, and his books can be found on Amazon and at his website, roryraven.com. As a mentalist and mindbender, Rory knows all the tricks of the spiritual trade, and we thank him for this informative discussion. Find Richard Barron's Lizzie Borden Girl Detective stories at Amazon.com and at LizzieBordenGirlDetective.com, where you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Listen to more Lizzie Borden podcasts on our website or on Podbean, Audible, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, Spotify, and YouTube.